is going to talk about dust destruction by the reverse shock in Pakistan. Sorry for this. Uh, hello, welcome to my talk. I want now to talk about dust destruction, not laptop destruction. Um, I'm from University College of London, and following the talk of Felix, uh, you will hear some things about can dust survive the reverse shock. So uh, first of all, we have heard today several times that dust forms in the ejector of supernova remnants. But on the other side, of course, supernova are very energetic, uh, there are shocks, we have high velocities, we have high temperatures, and this might result in a significant destruction of our dust. We have thermal and kinetic sputtering there, and also going vein collisions. And this uh, curves, uh, that's why we have a danger that the freshly produced dust in our supernova remnant gets uh, immediately destroyed. So there are two questions I want to focus on my talk. Uh, first one is how much dust can survive, and the second one is which dust can, yeah, which dust can survive. So uh, here again the reverse shock in Casse. Uh, we've heard a lot about it, uh, I think. So we have a forward shock, which is impacting cecum cellular material. Uh, it generates a reverse shock, which is traveling inside, and uh, there it can impact. Uh, ejectors, uh, clumps, and uh, knots where the dust is located. And this is exactly the situation we want to model. We perform hydrodynamic simulations. Um, we use the hydro code uh, astrobear and want to model what happens when a shock is impacting a clump. And um, uh, so we have an uh, ambient medium of gas in yellow here and uh, high density gas clump and from the left side is a shock coming and it's traveling into the direction of our clump. It's impacting the clump and it's destroying the clump. Uh, two main parameters are that we have uh, pure oxygen here and a shock velocity of 1600 kilometer per second uh, which is representing the uh, yeah, situation in Cassay. So uh, a short movie. The shock is coming from the left side. It's impacting the uh, gas clump, and it's destroying it. So um, this is only gas. What you see here is the density of the gas, uh, because Asubir can't treat um, dust inside it. So we use a uh, post-processing routine. We develop the code uh, paperboards. Um, which is an external dust processing code. It uses the output of a hydrodynamical code like Astrobear and as an input. So we have the gas and as uh, the gas velocities and gas temperatures and put it in there and calculate with this the dust advection, the dust movement. We can calculate and also the sputtering rates and the uh, collisions of the grains. Uh, there are also other effects implemented like gas equation and charging, but there's no time in this talk to talk about this. And one word to paperboards, uh, the name is associated to the paperboards on the water because the dust behaves in the same way in the gas. It is advected by the gas like the boats on the water. The boats can be uh, sputtered when water is uh, making damages on the boats. And the boats can also collide and crash in many, many small pieces like the dust when they collide. The uh, dust is located within the clump. Um, it can be silicate or graphite. Uh, we have different uh, initial distributions, uh, like normal distribution or power law distribution are the most common ones. And uh, the uh, gas to dust mass ratio is very important uh, for our outcome. And um, yes, we use the gas velocity then to accelerate our dust in our simulations. Uh, we have the classical drag caused by collisions of atoms on our dust grains and the plasma drag, which is caused by uh, charged grains in our ionized uh, gas. And again, a movie, the top left panel here is the same movie as before, so we have only gas here, and the three other movies are pure dust. So on the top right is the um, very small grains, very tiny grains, five nanometer in radius, medium-sized grains, and very large grains, uh, 500 nanometer. 
And what you see is that uh, the tiny grains are very well coupled to the gas. It follows uh, the same or nearly the same behavior as the, uh, as the gas. For the medium-sized dust grains, show a different behavior because they are not as fast accelerated as the tiny ones. And there's a completely different behavior for the uh, large dust grains because they are too heavy to be accelerated at the same way like the uh, small grains. So the main thing you have to put here is that we have a uh, decoupling of small and large dust grains. Let's destroy the dust. First of all, we're sputtering. Uh, sputtering is the detaching of dust atoms by collisions with gas atoms. So we have a dust grain, which is in a gas. Then gas atoms are colliding on this dust grain. It's uh, picking up atoms from the dust grain. So the final dust grain size is smaller than the grain size before. Of course, it's uh, higher the higher the gas density is and the higher the temperature of the gas. Um, we do this not on an atomic basis, but on an uh, analytic approach uh, based on studies from Thielens et al. and Nozawa et al. Uh, we also implemented column forces as they are because uh, it has an impact when we have a grain, uh, charged grain and a charged uh, gas, then there's a repulsion of this, uh, or a repulsion force. And we also implemented a size-dependent effect uh, because very small tiny grains, our electrons might tunnel through these very small grains, which also has an impact. Um, then the grain-grain collisions, which is a little bit more complicated. We know, or we have seen, that different dust grain sizes have different velocities. So we have a relative velocities between small and large grains, which means they can collide. And um, Yes, in the figure B, you see what one single dust grain size would see from the other uh, dust grain sizes. Um, it is the, we can calculate then the probability for such a collision, uh, which is for low number densities proportional to the cross section of these dust grains. Uh, it is also proportional to the number density and to the relative velocity. And in case that a collision occurs, um, we have to take the uh, collision velocity, and if it is high enough, or larger than a vaporization threshold velocity, then uh, the dust grain is completely vaporized, so it is completely destroyed. Um, for lower velocities, it might uh, fragment in different or in many, many small uh, pieces, and these small pieces are then again treated as new dust grains, which can then uh, travel around. There's also bouncing and sticking implemented, but for yeah, this is not very important because the uh, velocities in, the, in our simulations are, in most cases, too high, that it has uh, a significant effect. OK, um, this is now a grain size distribution. On the x-axis, the grain size. On the y-axis, the number density. Uh, we take care that, uh, please note that this is a logarithmic scale. <clears throat> and we can involve it now with time. And what you see is that the number of dust grains is decreasing. And there are two different regions uh, in, our, uh, in the plot. Uh, for the large uh, dust grain sizes, um, um, mostly grain grain collisions are destroying our material. And for the small dust grain sizes, uh, sputtering is the dominant dust destruction. Um, in this simulation here, mostly of all dust is destroyed. And uh, what we can do now is we can integrate our dust mass in the complete domain and uh, plot it as a function of time, which is shown here in the, the red curve. Uh, at the beginning, we have, of course, 100%, and then it is very fastly destroyed after 20 years uh, to, yeah, mostly or nearly uh, 0%. There's another thing I want to highlight here is um, that both grand grain collisions and sputtering are important. Uh, if we consider only grand grain collisions without sputtering, we get a destruction rate of around 40%. Uh, same is true for the uh, sputtering, the blue curve. So both combined would be 80% destruction. 
20% survival, but that's not true. We see that everything is destroyed. The reason for this is that the green ring collisions are working for the sputtering. Green ring collisions not only destroy dust by uh, vaporization, they also fragment. And this fragment conserves the dust mass. But these smaller dust grains, which are produced by the green ring collisions, can then easier sputter. And this means green ring collisions are forming smaller dust grains, and these are then sputtered. And that's, this is the reason that uh, the dust destruction rate for the combined processes is much larger than uh, the individual contributions. Here, everything, or nearly everything, is destroyed. Uh, this is not always the case. Um, the initial distribution matters. And uh, here's a lot of stuff on these slides. Um, I want to pick up only a few information. The bottom left panel shows an initial log normal distribution. And this log normal distribution is described by two parameters. We have the peak dust grain radius from 10 nanometer to 5 micrometer. And the y-axis gives us information about the width of our log normal distribution. Uh, very low values are very um, <coughs> narrow distributions, like here the violet curve, or very, yes, uh, sigma of 2.2 gives us a broad width risk. Uh, yeah, where we have a lot of dust grain sizes. And uh, the color coding of uh, this plot gives us uh, information about how much dust can survive. And pink shows very large amount of uh, dust survival, up to 12%. And this is in a dust grain size range from 100 to 500 na uh, nanometer, approximately. And green, yeah, mostly everything is destroyed. And it is at very low sigmas, so we need a very, very uh, narrow uh, distribution. Uh, on the right side, we have a power law distribution, uh, different parameters. OK, so last slide. And um, it's defined by a minimum and maximum grain size radius. But I don't want to go into detail here. Uh, what you can see is, again, that in this region, we have um, surviving rates which are most promising that dust grains with this size uh, can survive uh, the worst shock. Um, on the diagonal on this plot is uh, the single dust grain size distribution. This means that in the code there's only one single dust grain size at the beginning. And this gives us the um, most promising values. So there are dust survival rates up to 35%. Um, but it's a question if it is artificial or if it, or it is realistic that only one single dust grain size can exist at the very, very beginning. So, yeah, it's a question of this can be. And um, then I want to summarize my talk. I, as we have developed the code paper boards, uh, which can, is it, yeah, which can uh, calculate the dust processing uh, in, a, in a gas stream. Um, most important effects are, of course, the advection, sputtering, and ground grain collisions. And as, yeah, for the dust survival in Casse, we can say that 10 to 20 percent dust survival are realistic. Uh, we need for this a narrow uh, initial grain size distribution and uh, grain sizes of 100 to 500 nanometer. Grain grain collisions and sputtering are synergetic. And uh, yeah, we have also treated some different <coughs> stuff with cooling functions, um, which shows similar results. So, I, yeah, there's no time left. I can't speak to words. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks, Florian. Any questions for Florian? Um, I would like to ask a question about grain size. An earlier work by Nozawa or Bianchi, as far as I remember, reported large grains survive more efficiently, I would say, than small grains destroyed more efficiently. Uh, sorry, large grains can survive, whereas small grains are destroyed much more efficiently. Whereas your results are not, I think, it might be impression. I have not really looked at the size in actual yep. size, so I don't know, but at least in general trend, it's not the same. So what, what do you think that's caused that difference? Uh, it depends what 
large task grain size means. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Um, I know that Nozawa et al. has another paper for the dust formation paper. They found for Kevin dust that the peak is at 10 nanometer um, with a medium uh, width. So it's, it would be you know, around there. So not very much which could survive uh, at all. And I think this is already five micrometer. I'm not sure if uh, Nozawa considers such large dust grain sizes. And um, the main difference, so I don't know really, don't know <coughs> if he considers green grain collision in this case. And he does not. Okay, he does not. Didn't consider green grain collision. Okay, this is then the main result. If I would uh, neglect the green grain collisions, um, the large grains would survive. So most of it would destroy it here, but here would, would everything destroy, uh, survive. Because sputtering, yeah, imagine you go to much larger dust grain sizes, you have here a planet. Uh, sputtering on a planet is, yeah, it's mostly survive everything, 99.999. Any other questions? Uh, sorry, I, I think I missed your explanation, but what, is your hydro simulations in 2D or 3D? I didn't say it. Uh, so the, this is based on a 2D simulation. So, because so yeah, if you do a 3D simulation, you have another de degree of freedom for the stuff to go around. So would you expect more dust grains to survive in a 3D? No. <laughs> <I'm not laughs> so I can't say it with 100% confidence, but I, so I, at the moment I don't see a reason why it should much more survive or watch why much more should, uh, should uh, be destroyed. I think there will, will be some differences, but um, I don't, yeah, I, there are other parameters which are more, much more important. Uh, for example, the dust to gas mass ratios or the densities, um, which um, makes a lot of difference, yes. And for one more quick one. Um. Okay, uh, just for clarification, there is a direct computing time allocation application currently in, which will enable 3D calculations yes. to be done. And I have a, a question. The clump density that you were using was 100 particles per cubic centimeter for the gas. What would you expect to happen if you were increasing the clump density to 1,000 or 10,000? And keeping constant the density in the emit medium? Uh, yeah. Uh, I think mostly of it will survive because the shock will have large problems that it could impact the clump. So, and then the shock is not inside the clump and then not much is happening. So, um, yes, you agree, I guess, yeah. <laughs> Maybe just one more quick one. Yeah, it's just a comment um, regarding your question, in fact. Um, I think when it comes to chat brewing, uh, the going from 2D to 3D will matter because if you have particles, particles moving in a plane, uh, they're more likely to hit each other and shatter. I, that's what I would su suspect anyway. Um, There's one more degree of freedom and... No. Because, Are you sure? Uh, yes, yes. So in the way it is treated, uh, it's no difference. Okay, I don't know how, how you treat yeah. it, but okay. But, uh, fine. <laughs> Maybe a conversation for later. Okay, let's thank Florian again. <laughs>